Ready? Okay. So, um, good morning. If you're just joining us, this is the SPS 2018 uh, International Symposium and Workshop. Uh, we've just finished the opening uh, session, and now we're going to uh, begin uh, the first of two uh, mini workshops uh, and try to engage in a more in-depth discussion of two topics. Uh, the first of these is spectrum for wireless power transmission. Uh, and the second is uh, this afternoon after lunch, 2 o'clock, uh, we're going to talk about the uh, recently initiated um, International Academy of Astronautics uh, study group on space solar power, a decadal study on space solar power. So to open up the, uh, this first workshop on spectrum for wireless power transmission, uh, James McSpadden from the um, uh, formerly of uh, Texas A&M, and more recently of the Raytheon Company. Uh, he's not really following in Bill Brown's shoes. As I recall, Bill's feet were much larger. <laughs> Whatever. But nevertheless, it's just, just a little joke. I, I think Bill's feet were actually fairly reasonable size. Um, but nevertheless, so please, James McSpatt. And Bill, by the way, was much taller than me, too. <laughs> and better looking. Yes. Uh, <laughs> all right. Uh, the reason uh, uh, this topic is of interest to me personally is because of um, after the number of years um, working in the technology side of this um, wireless power beam, and, um, there is not a uh, service identified by any regulatory body on the planet for doing power transmission. And I'm about to jump into go a little deep here with the uh, regulations associated with this, uh, primarily from uh, the United States viewpoint and the FCC and NTIA point of view. Um, and then it's also my uh, point I want to bring up is this is not a human safe issue. It's an electronics safe issue. So meaning that the jamming capability of such a power beam from space is not to be concerned about well, what it does to people. It's what it does to your PDAs and cell phones and things like this and Wi-Fi networks. So um, that's the intention is to eliminate this fact. So some of the things I'm going to go over are going to go down deep in the technical side. If there's anything that does not come across very clear, uh, please stop. This is a workshop, open meeting. Okay, as an introduction, um, I believe that the, um, the electromagnetic compatibility with existing regulatory services is a very complex issue. Um, I do a little comparison of a typical comm signal in terms of its power strength and on the order of a power beam single tone type of um, spectrum. And of the solar power satellites we're talking about, typically on about a gigawatt level, this is 13 orders of magnitude stronger than anything that's allowed regulatory wise. They're about. And so we're talking about um, a major difference um, and try, trying to find a spectrum, a defecation. I'm not going to say allocation, because we learned that um, the, the use, the, the jargon is very important to the ITU uh, and then also all the, all the regulatory bodies. Allocation means that actually they have defined a service um, for, boom, um, for um, um, doing a particular um, application. And there's all kinds of applications I'm about to bring up. But the ones that um, uh, we're talking about, so they said, you don't really want to fight that. Define, yes, John? Define ITU. ITU, International Telecommunications Union. They're the United Nations of Spectrum. And they meet periodically in Geneva to sort out the world's um, spectrum requests for different applications. For example, a very big one going on right now is the 5G upcoming tsunami of RF allocation. That's going to, that has been in the works for 10 years now, trying to sort out with all the countries involved um, how to do this and how to go about allocating spectrum for that service. So instead of trying to, again, identify a allocation, we're going to identify a identification. <laughs> I'm double speaking here for speak spectrum. Um, so, um, and, and also this interference question comes up. What is the definition of it? FCC defines it as, this is the effect of any unwanted 
radiation effect in another service that's already allocated for a particular application. So um, you cannot degrade another existing system's performance, in other words. You do that and you're going to face some, um, probably some big legal implications or they'll shut you down completely. All right. The spectrum. Okay, I want to show you the NTIA chart for how we look at the spectrum from the United States point of view. NTIA is, is National uh, Telecom, Telecom Telecommunications Information, Information Agency. Agency. Thank you. Um, just to put it point of view, I, I'm, I work for a defense contractor, Raytheon. Raytheon deals with the NTIA, which is government use spectrum. FCC is dealing with commercial use spectrum. So, but they work hand in hand to so make sure that they align their applications together so they don't overstep their bounds. So very similar to NTIA and FCC, they're very similar regs. But you can see this is from DC to about 275 gigahertz. And all these codes in here, all these colors represent services in a, in a primary and secondary surface use. And they're all kinds. They're identified by all these boxes over here on the left in terms of what they're used for. Space to earth come, earth to space, space to space, terrestrial ground. It, it, they're all covered here. And, what, and, and they go in further detail if it's a radio location, a, a radar, if it's um, a comm service, if it's whatever service. They're identified and allocated. And I'm going to highlight here is this very, uh, very, very crowded region of um, basically 2.4 to 9 gigahertz, which has been the traditional fertile ground for trying to use for this particular application for atmospheric reasons. And um, so I'm just pointing out that there, are, there is no spectrum to be used unless you ask permission or get permission to do it. If you look a little bit further into the ITU commercial and government satellite um, spectrums, you can see the allocation. This is, so it narrowed it down from basically VHF, low frequency, 300 megahertz to, oh, we'll go up to 30 gigahertz. And look at all the com satellite com links up and down in terms of their commercial or government use. So if we were to look at around 2.4 gigahertz, we would find some satellites here that are associated with near our 2.45 or 5.8 gigahertz band of being my use. You do not want to try to interfere with a downlink service. In other words, if you're beaming energy down and you have a the receiver on the ground that's trying to intercept these satellite signals, you do not want to interfere with them. You're not allowed to do that. So this presentation is using this as a backdrop is to illuminate this fact and also talk about the rigs and maybe talk about a way of how to reason with how do we get to a spectrum that will do this. Otherwise, this is all academic. And it's been proven over and over for companies have been completely squashed by not abiding by regulatory uh, power radiation. Okay, switching off the um, spectrum map, I'm gonna look at a little bit about map spheric, and, and this has been touched on a little bit by John already. All right, if you look at clear sky attenuation, let's look at from DC to 35 gigahertz. You see, looks really low. This is dB per kilometer through the atmosphere on a clear blue day. Now when you throw in rain into the mix here, this is what happens into that kind of scale. Now we're talking about dBs of attenuation of per kilometer. And so I said, okay, if we never want to accept more than 3 dB of attenuation, even in a heavy thunderstorm per kilometer, Let's limit these frequencies to nine gigahertz or less. And let's go out there and look at the spectrum allocations that exist today and see if there is any way of fitting a particular frequency for this application. Another thing on the left here is what you're fighting is the f cost or the physics of what John already said. Yes? So would you please, uh, for those who are non-specialists, would you translate uh, dB in percentage uh, attenuation? Okay. Um, 1 dB represents 20% loss of your power link, for example. 3 dB, half power, is 50% of your loss. So, so please... the original signal goes away. 50% yeah. per kilometer. Right, per kilometer. And the atmosphere, the thick part of the atmosphere, is a few kilometers thick, depending on where you are on the planet. Up in the Arctic zone, so it's very thin. Down 50, and then what's left is down another 50, and then what's left is down another 50... Yes, as you get further closer to the equator, you get further more and more thicker atmosphere to deal with, obviously, because you have more humidity in the air. DBW, which one are you talking about? DBV or DBW? 
Um, dBs, just pure dBs, 10 log of the number. Yeah, I'm not talking about power. I'm just talking about if you have 3 dB of attenuation, that's half your power is being going to be absorbed into the atmosphere by RF, and converted into heat. RF energy. RF energy power. Okay. Um, that's not how we work it, but that's, that's the same kind of thought process. Half your power is lost. Okay. Um, any confusion about when I say dBs? So, okay. Okay. All right, uh, the physical reality is this. If you use a 2.45 gigahertz aperture, this is shown in comparison to a 5.8 gigahertz aperture. And I show that comparison because they're doing electrically the same thing. They have the same directivity. And directivity means how much the energy is pointed toward a target. So this is the physics of a lower frequency is a much larger aperture uh, compared to the going higher frequencies. And I pick on these two frequencies here because they're Industrial, scientific, and medical band frequencies, ISM band frequencies. And they have been the two frequencies of choice over the years for research and for studies in terms of doing this application. Back in Bill Brown's days, uh, you know, he was the 2.45 gigahertz was the real one. Of, of lately here, 5.8 has become um, of very much of interest too. Okay. Moving further, um, ITU divides the world in three different regions. Okay, it gets more complicated than that. Each one of these regions, let's pick on North America and South America, region two. The countries have to get together and abide by what frequencies they want as a collective entity within their country. Then the country goes out and tows to their continent. So there's this North American delegation that, that gets together. Then there's a South American delegation, Central American delegation. They, <laughs> they discuss their spectrum uses and their applications. Before, long before they ever tried to go to the ITU and present their information to that body. So there's, the world is divided between not only the physical locations, but the primary and secondary services. Primary is king. They get to own that frequency for whatever they and tend to do, abide in by the radiation characteristics that's set up by these bodies. Secondary services, and so is a application that wants to use the same spectrum. However, there are caveats to that. They cannot interfere with the primary service guy. All right, so if they do that, they're going to be shut down and have to make, take corrective actions. Um, and they cannot claim protection from that primary service either. And then after that, if there's another secondary serv service fighting with another secondary service within the same frequency range, then they have to basically sort it out themselves in order to survive. So that's how the ITU views this superficial you know, at the top level of how to handle primary and secondary. This is extremely important because you want a solar powered satellite to have primary service. How do you make that happen? So that's what this discussion, this workshop is all about. Okay, um, and let's dig a little bit deeper. What's going on at 2.45 today and 5.8 gigahertz? These two primary key ISM bands. A lot is going on in those bands. Um, I put it down here as a footnote, but there's, called, there's a website called the Spectrum Dashboard, and you can go to this website, and it shows you exactly what's going on in every region of the country um, in terms of spectrum. Who's using it, what it's used for, and where it's located. It's really a world of information is found there. But if you look at 2.45, what is going on at 2.45? All kinds of applications, amateur radio, ISM band equipment, which means Wi-Fi, uh, wireless communication networks, all right? You have fixed microwave, te television, radar. It's also occurring within this band. And mobile satellite services, and the list goes on. And this is, country, and this is across the entire country. The 5.8 gigahertz is a similar list of culprits here in terms of what they're using this ISM. So ISM, you would think that's industrial, scientific, and medical, meaning you would think it's for primary just research. It's not allocated for anybody. That is not true. That is not true whatsoever. You have to play with these guys using the rules set up by the FCC and the NTIA in order to operate in these frequency ranges. And failing to do so, um, it has severe consequences. So, Jim, yes, Jim, yes, Joe. Whatever Jim. happened to CB radio from the 70s and 80s? Um, internet, um, cell phones, uh, I don't know. <laughs> is it still out there? For um, yeah, it, 
Yes, it probably is, and it's very low frequency. Okay. Very low. That's way, way lower than all this. Yeah. Yeah, low megahertz, I believe. Thank you, sir. Okay, moving on. Radio astronomy bands. Okay, the radio astronomy bands granted by... Yes? There's a split in Region 1. What is this? No, that's that, right? If you see Region 1 goes over the Caucasus Mountains, I guess. Yep. Why, is, why is Region 1 but Siberia on both doing sides? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just curious. I, mean, I have no idea why the ITU has like set it up this way. Four up here or something. Uh, I'm sorry, don't know, Daryl. I would recommend you to go to the ITU website and, and study all you want. I don't know. Good answer. So the radio astronomy bands, this is really important too. They have selected frequencies that have been held to them over the years for a long time. And they own it. And they're not giving it up with a huge fight. Okay. So what I'm showing is highlight from basically up to 300 gigahertz. These bands that they have claimed as a primary service owner. And they're listed over here on the right in terms of those regions that we just spoke about and the, how the ITU views the world. Uh, from, you know, starting at 1.4 to 1.27, for example, for all three regions. Um, then we have this federal and non-federal uh, US bands um, that, again, you, you go worldwide, then you go into inside your country, and study your spectrum inside your country, and see how it lines with the, the ITU or not. So there's some minor differences here, but not major. But these, are, these are primary service radio astronomy bands, and they have to be avoided at all costs. Those receivers are extremely sensitive. I'll tell you a story. The, um, um, down in Tucson, there is a radio astronomy site on top of the mountain by the city. And when the Iridium satellites came over about 1.6 gigahertz, they'd have to close their aperture because the power level from an Iridium satellite, a comm signal, would basically destroy their low noise amplifiers. Think of a power beam that's 13 to 14 magni orders of magnitude higher than that. Well, that's the power density in space you're talking about. No, I'm talking about on the Earth. So you're mm -hmm. talking about under a rectangle? Uh, no. No, no, no. Down on the surface, like you would receive it here on the planet. Well, the radio, the radio telescope's not <coughs> underneath the shield. It's, it's pointed at dark space, and the emitter goes by overhead and roasts Yes, that's what happens. Very tempting. They will, yes. the, the, the power beam will have to abide by the energy density requirements for existing uh, equipment. My point exactly. Right? Yes. <laughs> All right. So if we look at space to Earth, this is these downlink signals from the satellites. Um, okay, you've got a whole deluge of, of these primary services going on. And they're listed over here on the left. Um, and what there are in, in table-wise and similar to format here is looking at these primary services space to Earth. Again, you're talking about a receiver on Earth, a transmitter in space, just like in a solar power satellite, but we do not want that solar power satellite to jam or damage these receivers that are occurring in these bands across the planet. So I'm, I'm showing like a framework of how to maybe find a spectrum. And so that's why I'm bringing up all these details about what exists today and what's in the books and what everybody on the planet abides by. Um, so let's take two use cases here. On the left here is the uh, reference system from 1980, 2.45 gigahertz with this dimensions. On the right here is a 5.8 gigahertz. This is a solar high um, type of um, uh, to construct but Hugh Davis. I'm just taking dimensions and aperture sizes just for a case study and look at what happens with the radiation patterns that they create on the Earth. And so you can see the um, system parameters here on the left. They're both geo-based. Um, and you have a much larger system because of a 2.45 gigahertz is a lower frequency than a 5.8 gigahertz system. <coughs> so their rectenna diameters are re shown here. And then you have the efficiency chain. So this is a 5 gigawatt system on the left for the uh, reference system. Uh, Hugh Davis was promoting a two gigawatt system here for the solar high. So there's a little bit lower power density with the 5.8 gigahertz system compared to the reference system. Again, this is just eliminating the kind of effort you would have to go through to look at what's going on with these power beams. Are your slides available to us? I, 
Uh, yes, if you want a copy of this, come see me. Well, and also, our, uh, just to be clear, our plan is that one of the reasons we're having everybody sign up and provide their email address is so that we can uh, later put together proceedings from SPS 2018, including uh, the slides that everyone is presenting and so on, and make it available to all of the participants. There'll be a website, just yep. like for last year's uh, you know, sessions, that where all the presentations will be available. Right. And we'll let you know. Okay, so let's move on to comparing these two systems here. All right, what I show on the graph on the right is kind of eye-catching because what it's showing is the 5.8 gigahertz system in blue and the reference system in red in terms of its radiation pattern and the power contained in that captured by the rectenna. So the solid represents how much is being captured by the rectenna size and for the two systems. Outside of the rectenna area, you have these things called side lobes. And they're just the physics of the radiation pattern. Even though both of these beams are tapered to have the first side level about 25 dB down from the main peak, they have their patterns that exist um, and they continue off into outer space because they go very beyond the limbs of the Earth. So what I'm trying to do is say how much power is actually in these side lobe levels because these are potential interference to somebody on the ground. And for example, of the systems I just eliminated in the, the prior slide, Seven, roughly 800 megawatts is going to be contained within, spatially contained within those side lobe levels for that 5 gigawatt system. If you look at 5.8, roughly 200 megawatts is going to be radiated outside of the rectenna boundary. So, okay, this is where it comes interesting with the regulations. Um, let's look at first the um, near ISM band frequencies. What do they exist on the planet? So, I've got... I have some really small numbers here, is what I'm getting at. The, from the, um, this, is, this, this is coming from the, what we call the NTIA Red Book. The Red Book is a wonderful book of documenting every application and every power density that exists for all these services for every frequency, meaning do not exceed these, these power limits. And this is are the numbers here. We're talking minus 136 dBm um, per meter square is a power density in the grant on Earth. Uh, depending on what angle of arrival it comes onto the Earth. In other words, these numbers here are on the order of, say, 0 0.1, 0 0.01 milliwatts per meter square. The reason why I'm using dB is because these numbers are basically 0 0.0000000, continued on, milliwatts per centimeter square. So we're dealing with side lobe power that is much higher than what they're recommending for these um, bands of operation. Okay, just want to eliminate what the space to earth limits are from the NTIA Red Book. Radio astronomy band thresholds are much stricter. Oh my goodness, they, they're talking dBW per meter square. There are numbers that are much lower than these. They're slightly different frequencies, so what you have to get at, the, the advantage of a solar power satellite system is you're dealing with a tone, a single frequency with its phase noise characteristics. So what happens is that you can really try to filter it down to that spectrum there. Side lobe radiation. Let's take a look about what goes on. Yes, John. Just a, a note on the previous slide. And of course, for, for radio astronomy, um, the, the, the good news for radio astronomy for the last 30 years has been the advent of modern devices and high efficiencies and uh, low noise amplifiers and all of these things. Fabulous. The bad news is the proliferation of, of mobile devices that transmit all over the damn spectrum, all over the damn place. And so they end up with good radio astronomy becoming impossible anywhere near an urban center because there's just too many emissions. And they, yep. they go to isolated places in deep <laughs> valleys in West Virginia. Antarctica. Uh, Antarctica, things like that. <laughs> in order, not, not because of solar power satellites, but to get away from... Yes the sea of RF noise that we live in now. Yes. So thank you, John. Excellent lead-in. So I'm going to pass around something for, to you guys. This is more a tribute to uh, Bill Brown as well. Um, this is a Bill Brown thin film rectenna. Oh, this is an actual one that works. Um, I have uh, made this in my garage. So it is the garage kind of quality here. <laughs> So no judgment on Raytheon, all judgment on this guy right here. 
I would like to pass it around just for giving you guys a perspective about what a rectenna really looks like. It has diodes and the printed circuit on here. There is a foam layer separation and there is a backplane as a reflector. 2.45 gigahertz. And again, back to the point of how much easier the physics is for, for space solar power than, say, fusion. And extremely cheap <laughs> technology. Uh, back to your point and Paul's point. Very, very cheap to make this. This is pick and place machine, and there's just that's ambiguous out there in the industry about placing parts down. Um, also, please be careful with this. It is fragile, uh, and it is my gift to John Mankins after this please conference. Don't break it. Please don't break it. Yes, and so um, um, please handle with care. Yes, sir. Could a, could a garage band use that as a speaker? <laughs> I don't know about that. Yeah, maybe you'd have to put some uh, some metal uh, uh, piezoelectric. Yeah, well, well, yeah. Let me get back to the topic of hand here. Um, this is, um, anyway, I want to move on to the next one because I want to go over each one of these four, re four concerns here for interference. Obviously, the side lobe and radiation frequency. Then we have harmonics that are created by the solid state electronics or, or tube electronics within a transmitter. Okay? Then we have phase noise from this transmitter. It has to be analyzed. And then you have black body radiation that actually would exist off this kind of large satellite. Let's take a look at those things individually. First one is side lobe radiation. All right, what I have done here is plotted that radiation pattern. Here is the 2.45 gigahertz system. Here's the 5.8 gigahertz system. Here is this radiation power, power pattern. <laughs> coming from the, Earth, from the satellite and its power density at the Earth's surface. And what I've done here is overlaid, oh, just for reference, I, I'm going from, um, say, right there at uh, Nader, pointing toward the center of the Earth, out to the, the limbs of the Earth from a geosynchronous orbit. So it's roughly about, um, I don't know, 5,500 kilometers as the, you look off from broadside to the edge of the Earth. So that, I'm interested in what that radiation pattern is doing for both systems. For reference, the width of the United States is around 4,800 kilometers. And so basically, if you had a rectenna in Kansas, uh, you would have basically these radiation power levels to deal with up to maybe 2,000 kilometers. What I've plotted over here. Minus 100 dB, though. I mean, what's the energy density you're talking about? Uh, that's what my, my point is about. You see these lines here? These are what Bluetooth sensitivities are, for example. If you exceed that number, you're going to jam a Bluetooth device. Okay, for I would say the 2,000 2, kilometers out, these side lobes are going to reach across the entire United States and jam Bluetooth devices, potentially, if they don't channelize them. Yes? Yes, and if you have dozens or hundreds of rectangular sites, those side lobes are all going to be overlapping and stacking on top of each other. If you have multiple transmitters, yes, I agree. This is one transmitter. Right. Okay. Okay. You look at um, the Bluetooth, uh, no, excuse me, eight, let me jump to 802.11 standards. They're more stringent. They're way down here. So the thing about these Wi-Fi receivers is they do channelize them and they do filter them within the modems. So in other words, if you ever looked at the spectrum of a Wi-Fi emitter, you can get these downloads from the internet, it's great. And you can go and see it at your local house, for example, what your spectrum is doing. There's a series of about 16 channels that they operate under, and they're bouncing around trying to not interfere with the neighbor next door. Because as we all know, when we pull up our um, internet services, we can see all the emitters around us. Well, that's how sensitive these receivers really are. They're detecting signals down here, minus 80, minus 100, dBm per centimeter square. And so what they do is they say, aha, there's somebody interfering with me. I'm going to bump your internet signal over here to avoid that interference. And, they, and they've worked it out to do that. Now, there's a potential play here. What if there's a frequency identification for one of those channels? And say, and if we can get the world to abide by it. Maybe. Yes, sir. In the, can I see the previous? Yes, sir. Uh, why the, the between the 2.5 and uh, 5.6? 5.8. Mm -hmm. Or why the difference of the bandwidth? Oh, 
Um, so the shaded area represents the diameter of the rectenna. And uh, let me back up here. So you'll notice that for 2.45 reference system is 10 kilometers in diameter, 5.8 is 7.5 kilometers. And the transmitter diameters are actually different too because they're high, different frequencies. So what you see in the shaded areas here are indicative of that directivity associated with that particular aperture size and how large the rectenna is. is does that answer your question? The bandwidth. Bandwidth. Yeah. So this is what single tone analysis. There's no bandwidth associated. It's one hertz wide. Yeah. But the bandwidth is different for the 2.5. This 1,000, uh, 1 megahertz. And uh, for 5.6 gigahertz, bandwidth is uh, just 4. Um, OK, so this is radiation patterns at one frequency. So there's no bandwidth associated with either one of these pattern analysis. OK, this is just showing for that particular frequency, for that size aperture, this is the pattern. I think he's talking about the table. Oh, I'm sorry. Were you talking down here? Yes. <sighs> Apologies. Down here, you're talking about? Yes. Yes. In the bandwidth, yes. in the last column. Yes. Yep. Right. You get to integrate that over a certain bandwidth. You're correct. You're very correct. Sorry, I've, I've failed to mention that point that he's bringing up. He was asking why is it different. Why is it different? Why, yeah. um, uh, that's a great question for the NTIA. <laughs> <laughs> They're the ones that set this stuff up. I'm just reporting on it. There's a question on costs. University, University of Fairbanks in Alaska has developed the HARP system. It's the youngest around the world for submarine communication and also for climate modification, that would give you some overload. They're running two to five megawatts between one megahertz to 10 megahertz and uh, all the UHF. Are you familiar with how that fits into the system? The cluster. That's the HARP system? Yes. Yeah, so the, the question was about a HARP system in, in Alaska that uh, emits on the order of 10 megawatts and plus of uh, power. And there are 18 locations around the world. In 18 locations around the world. I bet they worked it out with their re local regulatory bodies. The question went in Alaska, and they, they aim them by controlling the phase angle to control climate in Point Pan Pendleton, where the military bases are, to control climate change. That's the, the whole story. I, I, again, I'd have to say that they went, I went through a rigorous regulatory process to get to that. I do that regularly at my job when we have to work through this, and it's a process you work through with the regulatory bodies. I bet you a nickel they went to their congressman and said, There might have been that. There might have been that. I, I, I can't address your question because I don't know the details. It could be cross-modulation with what you're talking about. That's my point. Um, OK. Yeah, sure. Uh, yes, I don't know the details. OK. All right, let me move on to um, harmonics. So all right, the regulations stipulate you got to monitor not only your fundamental frequency at 2.45, 5.8, you also got to worry about the harmonics generated by this transmitter out to the 10th harmonic. And in a sense, this is what I'm trying to show. From the reference system, it was a, the baseline system was based on klystrons, and the klystrons had reported harmonic power levels with respect to the carrier of this level down. So 50 dB, 90 dB, 100 dB down for the second, third, and fourth harmonic. And from there, you can calculate how much power is in that harmonic. All right, for that second harmonic, it's on the order of 33,000 33, um, watts of power out of that second harmonic. Second harmonics are kind of nefarious because they create their kind of own radiation pattern out there. And you got to look at that too. So what I'm trying to show is, okay, what happens with um, a comparison to the radio astronomy bands and the NTIA regulations for these different frequencies, these higher harmonic frequencies. Didn't mean to do that. And it's plotted here on the right. So the reference system is on the order of, oh, 160 dB off from this near band uh, radio astronomy threshold. Just harmonics. Just harmonics. And so what this is saying is you've got to do a really good job of suppressing these harmonics because you want the electronics to be as efficient as possible. But to be as efficient as possible also means they're very nonlinear and they create these secondary, third area, fourth area, and it goes on and on. 
and you have to analyze all those harmonics out to the tenth harmonic and make sure they're not exceeding in these particular bands what they might be doing to uh, services on the ground. This is an example for a 5.8 gigahertz um, system. Um, I've used a uh, reference paper here with a high efficiency gallium nitride amplifier just for grins and compared this numbers and you can see a very similar trend over here that the harmonics of these, uh, this system is going to be really high compared to the radio astronomy bands um, and the ITU limit. So you have to work on so the reason why I bring this up is because it's all this whole efficiency chain. We want it to be as efficient as possible, radiating the power out. However, you got to add filters in there that are going to work against you in terms of overall efficiency. Phase noise. The spectrum coming out of a, of a, of a um, transmitter like this is not one hertz wide. We have this thing called phase noise and jitter that occurs with that tone. You can get it cleaned up really well, but it requires a fairly clean master oscillator to do this. And everything is hinging off that master off oscillator. And it is finally amplified out to where the, um, all these clastrons or solid state amplifiers are located. So what happens is, yeah, it amplifies that original signal, but it creates very low power type of um, uh, sideband energy. And it's part of that, associated with that tone. Um, so what I try to do is, based on Bill Brown's 2.45 magnetron experiments, where he actually uh, reported what the, the uh, offset frequency is and phase noise it was from these magnetron oscillators. Actually, this was the MDA, excuse me. He converted an oscillator into an amplifier. Um, and then compared it to a radio astronomy threshold. So what I'm saying is that power density by the phase noise is comparable to the radio astronomy, and it seems to be holding well for this particular case example. Yes? Is that MDA the same thing as amplitron? Yeah, it stands for Magnetron Directional Amplifier. Yeah. The, I'm thinking the, the uh, beam, beam width of the amplitron may be wider than the magnetrons which Japan and uh, Durgan are using right now. The beam width. Uh, that's an antenna term. I don't understand in terms of a tone signal. The, the, uh, the width of the beam coming out of the, uh, from a frequency perspective. Okay, that's a, again, an antenna parameter, not a magnetron parameter. Bandwidth. Bandwidth. Oh, thank you. Okay. Yeah, so you have to have very, Bill work very hard on this <coughs> approach to get that phase noise down as low yeah, as possible. Yeah. But uh, Gordon was telling me that when they were evaluating this in the reference, they didn't know how narrow the magnetron's beam width was. And if they had known how narrow that beam width was, they would have used magnetrons. Bandwidth. Bandwidth. Bandwidth, I'm sorry. Yes, um, okay. I'm just pointing out that you have to pay attention to this stuff, too, because it's going to bleed over into adjacent bands. Yes. I'm the 5G designs that are now being put in by Qualcomm. They're using both uh, qu say one quadrant, two quadrants, and four quadrant modulation for amplitude and for frequency. And that's how the 5G system is being designed. So it's a huge complex array of interferences and harmonics. And that's how they're getting 10 times the, the bandwidth, 10 times the frequency of speed, with a rate of data. So that's a whole other thing that's not been covered here. It, because this is an unmodulated signal. Right. Okay. And that's, so that's the beauty of this application is do not modulate this. But that's what they're going to do with all the 5G, big time. Fine. Let them do it. This is power beaming. We don't want to modulate this. Um, it probably has to be studied. It's all I'm pointing out here with this presentation is the studies that you would undertake to go after identification of a frequency and the concerns that you have to watch out for. Yeah. James? Yes, Seth. Uh, I don't know if this is a technical question or a terminology question, but at these levels of power we're talking about, not only is it not one hertz or, or an infinitesimally thin uh, bandwidth, uh, but the amplitude is not steady either. So a slight variation of amplitude, uh, you you in effect have a modulated wave. You can is that uh, phase noise or is that um, harmonic distortion or you could call it either one, I guess. But at 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 a, mm -hmm. at a thousand megawatts, mm -hmm. even a little bit is going to be significant. Yeah, AM to AM modulation would occur probably yeah. with this, basically on temperature differences. Yeah. Temperature changes across the yeah. aperture. 
Anything that ripples across that aperture yep. is going to yep. thicken the bandwidth. I, I'm not even getting near that topic Sorry. on this one. Yeah, that's a good point. Sorry, I couldn't sweeten the punch bowl anymore. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I have royally messed up the presentation here. John, what did you do to get back in full view? Sorry, guys. <laughs> Should I tap dance? Yes, let's go play. <laughs> You're fine. No worries. Thank you. Appreciate that. It's the virtues of a Mac. Yeah. Definitely, I'm not a Mac person. Okay. So, all right, let me move on after phase noise to black body radiation. This is interesting because um, let me show you a snapshot of the all sky survey at 1.4 gigahertz and how it's picking up satellites, small satellites, on the geo arc uh, from a radio astronomy point of view. So, there's black body because it's a real object with mass, it's going to emit its black body radiation. And so if you look at that, and these are small satellites. If we were to compare to a satellite on the size we're talking about here, what does it look like? So you work through some equations that involve in, um, uh, the Boltzmann's constant and the temperatures and wavelengths and emissivity of this. And then you roughly get to these two kind of system comparisons, and they're very low. So black body radiation from one satellite is below the ITU recommended thresholds for black body radiation. But that's, that's it. So there's a bright light here, but probably not much of a concern uh, for black body radiation. Okay, now having had that information about what you have to be worried about, let's say what can we do in terms of the existing spectrum and their services and in terms of identifying a frequency to use. So what do you want to do first? Eliminate the bands that you can't use, and that includes these primary service uh, bands associated with radio astronomy and, sp and space to Earth. Uh, for federal and non-federal applications. So there, there they are listed here. We do not want to go in them up to the 10th harmonic as well as the fundamental. And over here on the right, so let's, how's this compared to 2.45? What I'm showing in red is where you have an overlap with one of these primary service frequencies. Um, and so you see three of them pop up saying, oh boy, we're really going to have to deal with the third harmonic, the fifth, and the eighth harmonic and how do we suppress those. So same goes on for the 5.8 assessment where there are also three identified there in terms of direct interference to an existing service. Okay, unlicensed part 15, this is FCC jargon. Part 15 devices are like your Wi-Fi communication devices. Um, they are interesting because um, they're unlicensed in a sense that they have been approved for use because they are below a certain radiation standard as far as what they emit and um, the power density away from them. So they require such that they do not cause harmful interference to anything else, which is interesting because all your Wi-Fi routers are bouncing around trying to find a channel to use. All right, so um, if you look at um, typical use of the bands, so we, we've, this, these are all ISM, I mean, part 15, Echo, <laughs> um, that are now um, in use um, today. And they cover near the ISM band at 2.45, um, definitely approaching there the uh, 5.8 ISM band. Are these options? Um, so it's probably not. And the reason is because if you look at, um, if you were to apply for a Part 15 license, and I have to caveat this. this is